Heineke looking end zone, and it is intercepted by Rodney McLeod. Well, well, well. How the turntables. The Philadelphia Eagles have done it. They have exceeded most people's expectations and have made the playoffs. Even as a 7th seed with a 9-8 record, they have made a lot of improvements from the disaster that was last season. It hasn't been perfect, obviously, but they are here and in the dance. God bless the NFL for adding that extra game in there, although they still might want to fix the officiating. It's still horrible, by the way. The Eagles have once again made the playoffs in a very familiar spot that they've been in over the past couple of years, ever since winning the Super Bowl back in 2018. Wild card, bitches! Yeah! What? This season has been such an improvement, and today I want to review some of the major plot lines and stories that came up in my previous video of why I thought the team was the most intriguing. The link to that video I made will be down below in the description if you want to check out my thoughts and analysis from back then. So, uh, yeah, let's see how things turned out. Starting at the top with first-year head coach Nick Sirianni, a lot of people thought that this was a somewhat questionable hire when the season began. Jeffrey Lurie has been known to make the out-of-nowhere hire and turn these coaches into a success. Nick Sirianni, thankfully, is not an exception from this trend, even though it was quite a rocky start at the beginning. He started off 2-5 with questionable play calling and completely ignoring the run game. It was like the front office wanted Jalen Hurts to help out with everyone's fantasy team or something like that, and the game plan was obviously not working or producing the results they wanted. Nick decided to play to Jalen's strengths and take more of the pressure off of him by doing the one thing I myself have always emphasized in previous videos whenever I talk about or play Madden or any kind of football video game, and you all know what that is folks, say it with me. Run the dang ball! Even though this is a passing league, no quarterback should be throwing the ball 50 to 60 times a game. And it took Nick until week 8 to finally figure out this philosophy that setting up a run game helped up to open the passing more. This was definitely a problem Doug Peterson had with Carson Wentz by forcing too much of a passing game instead of relying on the run. Even in the past few weeks, most notably against the Giants in week 16, Nick tried to throw it too much in the first half of that game and it nearly cost them with the mistakes that were being made. It probably also doesn't help that both Howie and Jeffrey have sat down with coaches like Doug in the past and talked to them about throwing the ball more, which I'm sorry, but who made you guys the head coach of this team? They're seriously the reason I'm not more super happy about the turnaround because they are a growing pain on this team, but don't worry, we'll get to those guys later on. You can argue that the Eagles had a relatively easy schedule down the stretch, but as proven all year long with the NFL that with each week, anything can happen. Okay, we don't make up the schedule, all right? We're just being told who to play up against. It's why they lost to the Giants in embarrassing fashion, especially because I was there and I was supposed to be the good luck for them, so sorry about that guys. Nick has gotten better in regards to communicating and rallying the team behind his concepts. He hasn't been perfect, but he has proven that he can make adjustments and not be too stubborn enough to believe that everything he does works. Much like Doug, he mixes up the RPO with a lot of screens in his game, which can be a double-edged sword in this league. Even without someone like Booby Miles Sanders leading the way, Nick has led this team to number one in rushing with a historic run game that has not been seen since the 1985 Bears. He still has a lot to prove as a head coach, but his stock is trending upwards, so we'll have to see how things turn out in the next few years. Jonathan Gannon. Look, um, I'm sorry, but you have been quite the disappointing hire and someone who is somehow worse than Jim Schwartz. Like, how, how, honestly, how are you worse than Jim Schwartz? You are someone who is way in over your head with this prevent defense that you've been playing. While your defense has improved in terms of getting pressure and forcing turnovers in the last few games, it has come at the expense of really bad quarterbacks. I'm talking about practice squad type players. Whenever they played up against guys like Brady, Mahomes, even Justin Herbert, this defense got carved up. The defense was becoming very predictable with its soft zone coverage and became really annoying to see this week in and week out. It was a very vanilla and conservative defense with a terrible mix of the coverages and scheme that they were running. 
While Gannon was accountable for this, it feels like the defense still has some of the problems it's had all year. I mean, obviously, if you're depending on guys like Alex Singleton to help out with your defense, it's not really the best equation. I won't be totally upset if Gannon leads for another head coaching job. Just my opinion on that. I know it's gonna make some people mad, but I don't think this guy's really yet, Chief. Moving on to special teams, it's been kind of meh, to be honest. Although Jake Elliott has quietly had a Pro Bowl-like season, thank God, I know people wanted to have that guy cut, so really good to see Jake Elliott do well. The biggest question that I had made in the previous video about the team was, of course, Jalen Hurts. I know people, including myself, have been pretty hard on Jalen this year. I even made some pretty regrettable tweets that I ended up deleting because, well, you know, emotions take over sometimes when watching sports, you know, happens to the best of us. He's been on the I don't really know quite yet category for me this season. There are times where he's looked like a comfortable game managing quarterback who uses his legs to change the momentum of games. Someone who has a solid IQ and feel for the game and makes good decisions out on the field. Then there's other times where he doesn't look like that, he looks completely lost and takes shots that don't need to be taken. It truly has been a growing pain with him at quarterback, especially given the fact that this is his first full season as the starting QB, but I do see a lot of potential in him. He genuinely does seem like a cool dude and has proven in the past that he can be an exceptional leader of a football team. He just has to work more on his throwing power and accuracy during this upcoming offseason. I do hope he can prove his durability during these next few seasons, especially since his first instinct does tend to be take off and run instead of stepping up in the pocket and making the throw. He is well versed when throwing outside of the pocket, which he should do more. I just don't want anything super drastic to happen to him when he's scrambling for first downs or touchdowns a la Carson Wentz against the Rams in 2017, the whole career goes to hell, and yeah, it's not really the greatest plot point to have. He has all the tools to be a great quarterback, so I would definitely give him another year to prove he's worthy of that role. I have been a little bit more cynical of this team despite them making the playoffs. While this is huge and something definitely worth celebrating over, there is a looming shadow cast around the city of Philadelphia. Something that could ruin this team's recent success. You all definitely know what I'm talking about here. The front office. Howie Roseman. You are by far one of the most inconsistent general managers I have ever seen. While you are not the worst GM of all time, you certainly haven't done anything to help your case either. You somehow managed to keep your job these past few years because the Eagles lucked themselves into the playoffs with the final spot, kinda like this year. It really doesn't help either when you've had a history of bad relationships with current and previous players on this team. How you and Jeffrey Lurie believe in this concept that passing all the time is the way to go because, well, hey, that's what worked with Andy Reid and Doug Peterson. It's just, why stop now, right? Why stop with that? It, that's not the point here. The other big issue is the people you draft. While you are someone that does fine with offseason additions and free agencies and with trades, you hinder this team's success with some of these players you pick. You had to trade up with the Cowboys in this year's draft to get Devontae Smith because you screwed up the Justin Jefferson pick that badly. How the hell do you take Jalen Rager over that guy? Rager's done next to nothing this season, while Justin Jefferson is out here setting NFL records. This goes back to my theory about you not drafting a skills position player to save your life. While you have gotten picks right like Smith and Miles Sanders, you've also taken guys like JJ Arthega Whiteside over DK Metcalf, and guys like Marcus Smith over people like Odell Beckham Jr. and Todd Gurley. What goes on in your scouting department, Howie? It's beyond frustrating to watch you give guys like Wentz and Hurts next to nothing to work with and then wonder why they are not playing up to their own potential. And of course, Jeffrey keeps you around because of the one thing that over the past few years that has caused his team to be mediocre. And that one thing is loyalty. It was a similar thing that prevented the Seattle Seahawks from becoming a potential dynasty back in 2015. You wanted all the guys back for one last ride because you felt like you owed something to them. 
Do you know why teams like the 49ers from the 80s or the Patriots over this past decade have been so successful? It's because Bill Belichick and Bill Walsh knew when to move on and embrace change. They knew when a player's limits had expired so they could move on with different talent and have the same type of success. They also didn't have an incompetent owner who thinks that he needs to put his every stupid input on how to run this team. Your job is to make the team better by getting some players who know how to catch the freaking ball instead of dropping it every 5 seconds. Or guys that know how to make an open field tackle and play smash mouth coverage. People who actually know how to cover on their routes or people who know how to block and and aren't injury prone. Which by the way, you also draft guys like Landon Dickerson and Sidney Jones despite the injury history because you want them to have their own comeback story. Kind of like your own comeback story when you became GM again back in 2016 when Chip Kelly left. Because you, Howie Roseman, want to make yourself seem like the smartest guy in the room by going against the grain when the obvious pick is right there in front of you. It's completely arrogant, and I'm sorry if this sounds cruel, but not every single injury prone player you draft ends up being a Hall of Famer. Look, I know you don't expect this to happen with every pick, and I know you're a lot smarter than this, but good lord Howie, it's just like this team. Sometimes you just cannot get out in your own way and constantly shoot yourself in the foot. Yes, I know I rambled there a bit, and look, I don't really know or care what to expect from this team during this playoff run. I Honestly, I don't even expect us to beat Dallas in the first round. But you know what? I don't care. This season was a success based on where we were a year ago. Where we actively tanked on national television and got away with it. I'm already more focused on next season and wondering how we can try and improve. I just do not see it with Howie and Jeffrey at the helm. They did prove me wrong once before, but I highly doubt they'll do it again. If I'm coming across as ungrateful about how this season turned out, trust me, I am not. We made the playoffs and have three first round draft picks next year. That is a huge success in my opinion. Thank you again Carson Wentz for playing 75% of the snaps. I just worry about how the Eagles can possibly mess this up. And sometimes my patience runs very very thin with this team. Because trust me, I've watched this team my whole life and they always find a way to disappoint, but who knows right? It is truly the life of an Eagles fan. I'm just gonna let Michael Scott quote this last part for me. No question about it, I am ready to get hurt again. So thank you guys again for watching. I just wanted to give a little small recap based on the video that I made at the beginning of this NFL season on where I thought the 2021 Philadelphia Eagles were going to go, why I thought they're mo they were the most intriguing team, and um, yeah, I can't believe they made the playoffs, which is very exciting. So let's see how far it's going to go. How far do you think the Philadelphia Eagles are going to go? Let me know down below in the comments. Don't forget to leave a like on the video, comment, subscribe. And I look forward to seeing what is going to go on in the playoffs. So anyway, go birds, and I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone. Peace.